Next up is Paul Johnson with the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, Paul's home group is called the People's Health Coalition. All right. Thank you, Cole. Paul Johnson. Thank you, Jonathan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm here, as, as Cole mentioned, representing the Poor People's Campaign today. And we had a um, town hall meeting this morning in Quincy um, about, as, as um, was just mentioned, about as difficult a place to get to and from uh, MIT uh, or downtown Boston um, from for, using the MBTA. And, and as I mentioned to Jonathan, I prefer not to uh, ride in vehicles if I can ever help it. Um, that's a good segue because one of the things I want to just touch on today in, in the context of the Poor People's Campaign, which I think everybody here should be pretty familiar with what the Poor People's Campaign was, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, his, his final vision, uh, um, and of course um, it was carried out posthumously. Um, but stability, equity, and truth are, um, I'm big into acronyms, so stability, equity, and truth are, are sort of my fallback, and that spells set. So if you have those three things, you're pretty much all set. We don't have stability or equity in the transportation system in Boston, in greater Boston, uh, in the United States, for that matter. I lived in Southern California, where I don't even know if they know what light rail is yet. Um, so, so that's one issue, and that's a part of um, socioeconomic warfare, but I'm, I'm going to go there later. First, I want to talk a little bit about the Poor People's Campaign, or hopefully maybe more than a little bit. And I'm going to read some stuff. Um, I didn't really have a whole lot of time to get stuff completely organized, so please bear with me. Um, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is uniting tens of thousands of people across the country to challenge the evils of systemic racism, poverty, the war economy, ecological devastation, and the nation's distorted morality. So we've, we've chosen a, a pretty basic, easy, easy uh, platform. <laughs> uh, not really. Um, we are committed with the Poor People's Campaign of 2018. We are committed to lifting up and deepening the leadership of those most affected by systematic, systemic racism, poverty, the war economy, and ecological devastation, and to building unity across the lines of division of those most impacted by these evils. Um, the Poor People's Campaign is a bottom-up movement led by the poor. So myself and Cole are part of the organizing for it, but it's not about us. Um, we're organizers, I suppose you could say activists, what have you. But it's, it's really about um, standing shoulder to shoulder with ordinary people who maybe because of all the constraints of instability in their lives, lack of equity in their lives, um, maybe aren't in a position to um, be as involved as we are. So, so that's who we're, we're trying to um, work with and be shoulder to shoulder with in, in building this movement. And so in, in doing this, I, I'm a very analytical person, um, probably to a fault. Um, but so I just, one of the um, things I did is I just did a quick um, analogy, a quick breakdown, I should say, of who are the poor. Um, so in the United States, the poor, um, one out of every two people in America are poor or low income, 50%. It's actually 48.9. One out of every four African American or Latinos in the US live below the federal poverty line. Native Americans, African Americans, Latinos, and Asians make up 92% of US citizens living below the federal poverty line. One out of seven women in America live below the federal poverty line. And four out of every 10 people that experience homelessness every year in the United States are children. Uh, back to the PPC, the Poor People's Campaign, for a minute. Um, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is based largely in the principles of the Poor People's Campaign of 1968 through the vision of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., his final vision, as we know. Um, the Poor People's Campaign of 2018 Phase 1 will consist of six weeks of nonviolent moral fusion direct action. I'll say that again. 
non, six weeks of nonviolent moral fusion direct action. Doesn't really roll off the tongue, but it, it, it all fits together when we, when we think about it a little bit more. Um, and that's beginning on May 14th, the day after Mother's Day, about a month or so from now. Uh, five weeks, May 14th, 2018, the day after Mother's Day, with action centered on women, children, and people living with disabilities in upwards of 40 states around the United States. So what's going to happen is uh, sequentially, simultaneously, sequentially, what have you, um, here in Boston, there'll be an action at whatever time of day, and in Philadelphia, the, the, an action will be taking place um, uh, simultaneously and in New York City and, and where have you. And then as you, as you sequentially go through each time zone, um, that will be the case. That will be, it, it, it's very, um, it's a uh, sort of a um, very disciplined uh, approach to action. And 40 different states, and, and there's probably, I would say maybe roughly cool, in the 40 states, if you just figure a thousand people have some level of interest or have participated in some way, shape, or form, we're talking about 40,000 people in 40 states, and we haven't started yet. That's the key here. This really gets going on May 14th. There's been a couple of one-off press conferences, and, and I, I'm remiss. I didn't re mention that the Poor People's Campaign is a uh, dual um, endeavor through uh, the Cairo Center, which is Union Theological um, Center for, for Learning and, and Theology in New York, as well as Repairs of the Breach, which many of you may know, Reverend William Barber, uh, Jr. Um, he was involved with Moral Mondays, and then the long story short of it is he, this all came together, and the, um, the Poor People's Campaign sort of, um, he transitioned into that along with the people, the folks from the Cairo Center. And the main um, person, prime mover at the Cairo Center that's involved with this is named Dr. Reverend Liz Theo Harris. And she is a powerful person, as of course is Reverend Barber. So, so repairs of the breach, which was more Monday where a lot of people got arrested. There, were, there was um, a lot of direct action during that point a few years back has combined with the Cairo Center Union Theological, Reverend William Barber, Jr., Reverend Liz Theo Harris, um, and, and a whole group of married people. So I'm just going to read very quickly um, a couple of the fundamental principles um, and then just, just get into a little bit more context and, and try not to take too much time. Um, fundamental principle uh, number, number two, I'm going to skip over one for reasons I won't get into right now. But number two, we are committed to lifting up and deepening the leadership of those most affected by systemic racism, poverty, the war economy, and ecological devastation to building uni unity across lines of division. So I'm repeating myself there, but I think it's important to. Um, number eight, principle number eight, and, and I have a one-pager here. I, I don't know if you brought literature, coal or not, or, but we, we can make anything anybody needs in this room available very easily. We live in the digital age. So, um, but there's a one pager here. So if you don't have all this memorized, we are at MIT. So maybe we, I guess we won't have a quiz at the end, but, um, fundamental principle number eight, we will build up the power of people and individual state-based movements to serve as a vehicle for a powerful moral movement in the country and to transform the political, economic, and moral structures of our society. Again, we, we picked a low bar challenge here to, 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 to get, get going on. But um, a lot of times, I think in activism, the, the, there's, a, there's a fight, there's um, uh, an acrimony, um, which is good, of course. Um, it, it's 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 cathartic to um, let out emotion and to um, to be assertive. Um, but I think a lot of times we may lose sight of the fact that we have structural issues, and and I, I'm not necessarily saying people in this room. I am saying um, people who. Uh, are on a screen all day, especially the people that I see on the dysfunctional MBTA. Um, the world has kind of become zombified with, with the screens. And I don't think people really take time to connect on a personal level anymore. Um, 
I'm certain of that because I ride the MBTA a lot and I, I'm, I live in Boston. So um, that's important to, to mention here is the structural causes of what's going on. If, if we can foc on, focus on them, then we're, we're ahead of the game, I think, than, than where we are right at the moment. Um, fundamental principle number 10 is we will do our work in a nonpartisan way. Not, no elected officials or candidates get the stage or serve on the state organizing committees of the campaign. This is not about left and right, Democrat or Republican, but right and wrong. So in my view, first off, I'm upset that we need another poor people's campaign 50 years since Dr. King's death. That, that's, that's very frustrating to me. Um, and I'm not a person who's, uh, full disclosure here, I'm not a person who's really interested or see electoral politics um, as much of a solution. Um, so I, I'm interested, and, and I do organize primarily just at the, at the grassroots level, very, very grassroots, um, very much in the neighborhood, in the community, and, and that's, um, that's me. So fundamental principle number 10, it, without uh, elected officials or candidates running for office, we actually had a little issue with that today at the, uh, at the uh, meeting in, in Quincy, um, are, are not going to be part of this. They don't get the mic. They don't get to come up and give the flowery, uh, in my opinion, empty speeches um, where nothing comes of it in the end. And I apologize. I hope I'm not offending anybody here. But that's just, I'm speaking for myself, not for the poor people's campaign on that. But, but that's fundamental principle number 10. And then number 12, the campaign and all its participants and endorsers embrace nonviolence. Violent tactics or actions will not be tolerated. So. We could probably have a two-hour discussion on nonviolence and the, uh, the importance of it on, on all the various different levels. But it's just important to say that you may, you're going to see a lot of direct actions out of the Poor People's Campaign. But just like the, the Poor People's Campaign of 1968, um, violence will not be tolerated. And folks w have signed and will sign that are involved in direct act act actions. They will put their signature uh, on a sheet of paper that, that indicates that they, no violence will be tolerated, allowed, or, or uh, enacted upon anyone from coming from the Poor People's Campaign. Um, how are we doing on time, Cole? Uh, we should wrap up in a minute or two. OK, because I've got an awful lot of stuff. Um, Jonathan told me eight minutes. Cole said 10 to 12. I could go on a long time. Okay, good. I'm going to blast through this then. I'm actually really glad to hear that. Um, very quickly, I'll try to summarize as much as I can. So as Cole mentioned, I'm Paul Johnson. I'm with the uh, People's Housing Board Coalition, which the formation of this group was involved Mel King, Chuck Turner, Dorothea Manuela, a woman named Shirley Kressel, and myself and, and Two or three others, Jerry Scapatulo, who some of you may or may not know. He's he's the myself and Jerry are the people that names aren't very recognizable. But I'm humbled and gratified that I I was able to be with those leaders and build a knowledge base and an experience base with those folks. And now what we do is we um, organize around resistance to um, inequitable redevelopment in Boston. Again, we, we like to pick the real, uh, the, the real small stuff. Um, it, it's actually a disaster what's happening in Boston. And unfortunately, and again, I'm, I'm speaking on my own behalf right now, but unfortunately, we have a false progressive mayor. Uh, and Mr. Walsh is not, um, he, he's not the solution. I'll just leave it right there. Um, but so I organize currently in, in about seven different neighborhoods. Um, Roxbury would be the most primary as well as East Boston, um, Mattapan, Dorchester, South End, and I always skip somebody, but um, Charlestown. Um, and all those places, are, there's, there's a lot of different people's types of people, a lot of different ethnicities, a lot of different interests. Um, but there's one commonality, and that is that people who are in a, the position of low income, moderate income, or even, even middle slash high income are really very much in danger of being displaced from Boston. And, and I don't use the word displaced. I use the word dispossessed. 
because we are a city that is dispossessing people. And that becomes um, part of the socioeconomic warfare that this whole region is suffering from. And, and you know, to correlate with, with war in general, um, that's very much, there's, there's a war going on here at home, and that probably sounds a little cliche, and I think everybody knows that. But um, Dr. King, Dr. King spoke about uh, the beloved community. So I decided to base a little bit of my remarks today around the beloved community. And again, I'm always interested in what, where. Um, so I Google mapped the beloved community and they didn't have any directions there. So I had to do some more research. They wanted to send me to, uh, send us to Trenton, New Jersey. And I, I don't think Dr. King intended us to all march to Trenton. I'm, I'm pretty sure that wasn't about what it was about. But so he talked about, in reference to the beloved community, he talked about an overflowing love that seeks nothing in return. Hopefully I get this right. Agape is, is I think, the pronunciation. It's sort of a crazy word. Um, but overflowing love that seeks nothing in return. Um, that's, there's, that's, first off, there's humility involved in that. There's benevolence involved in that. There's, um, there's um, the opposite of self-centered involved in that. And, and those are all the things I think about with King, with Dr. King. Um, and again, I said I'm going to try to blast through this here. OK. OK. Um, OK, so uh, the conclusion will be this. Um, Dr. King based everything in love, in my view. Um, and there was, um, there's, to me, love equates to, when it comes to organizing and being in the community, equates to action. Um, so I think that the more we show up, the more we take action, just by showing up is taking action. All Everybody here listening is part of the solution, is, is part of resisting all the, the evils that we're talking about and the, the uh, instability here in, in, in the community. And um, I just want to, I'm, I'm going to blow through one more thing really quick here, Cole, if that's OK. Um, I want to read something to you folks. So. Raise your hands, I guess, if this sounds familiar. Um, a dual economy, much of the low-wage sector has little influence over public policy. The high-income sector will keep wages down in other sectors to provide cheap labor for its businesses. Social control is used to keep the low-wage sector from challenging the policies favored by the high-income sector, mass incarceration. The primary goal of the richest members of the high income sector is lower taxes. Social and economic mobility is low. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yes. Sounds like the United States of America, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually not. It's the social determinant um, checklist for uh, third world countries. And I know this because uh, Professor Peter Temin wrote a book called um, The Vanishing Middle Class. Uh, oh, gee, I'm forgetting the second part. But, but he's Professor um, Emeritus here at MIT. And, and those, again, are the, um, those are the social determinants to qualify and quantify a third world country. And in many respects, that's what we've become here in America. So the Poor People's Campaign um, is is all about turning that around as best we can and organizing a base so we can begin to turn that around and, and uh, hopefully to some extent fulfill Dr. King's wish, wishes for the, and the rest of all the, the people that were involved in the civil rights movement from 1968. And uh, so, so that's what we're up to. I can provide anybody with more information as well as Cole. Um, and, and I guess I, I just want to say, um, one last thing is if everybody's busy, everybody's really busy, and there's, um, it seems like, how could I ever take on one more thing? But if you can go to one community meeting a month of something that you're not involved with uh, presently, um, there's actually 730 hours in a month. And if you did something else for, for, for 10 hours a day and slept for eight, you would still have 150 hours in a month. So if you could remember that 730, 
And then the last number, if I could, if anybody's so inclined, is the number two, because at the end of the day, this, this is my view, um, and hopefully maybe it'll catch on, but at the end of the day, the beloved community is just two steps away at all times. The first step is getting up and deciding to go to a community. And the second step is going and showing the love that that community deserves, requires, and needs. Thanks for listening, everybody.